It is definitely orange. We're in 2021. This is the best year ever. I know it's going to be even better than 2020. What do you think, Max? Well, it's hard to imagine that 2021 could be better than 2020, but it's going to be better than 2020. And I can already feel it in the air. I can feel the electricity in the air. I can feel the pump. I can feel the pump. It's pumping up. You know, we're going to see some price levels in 2021. That'll shock the world. Shock the world! Yeah, I am. You know, I'm going to keep this shirt on. I think it's going to be my lucky t-shirt for 2021. I'm going to wear it every single episode. I've decided that it's going to be true. But you know what? You know, Max and I come from a background uh, in the gold markets. That's how we first met Bitcoin was via some gold people who, uh, you know, we were anti-central bank and gold is an alternative to the central banks. And then this tweet stream from Luke Groman made me really um, see at the end of the year just how bad gold is at at this time for anybody to hedge against central banks or governments, because of course they own a large quantity of it. So I'm going to look at this tweet from Luke Groman. Bitcoin's price is simply doing what paper gold leverage has been doing in recent decades. BTC's chart is reminiscent of what a chart of the number of paper gold ounces outstanding per physical gold ounce looks like. So he's saying like the actual price of gold has not captured this sheer quantity of people going into gold, but you could see the same parabolic move in the amount of paper gold that exists. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's what we've been saying since 2008 in particular. The uh, price wasn't really uh, increasing along with the massive uh, money printing that it had been more or less doing for a while. And and historically, that would be the relationship. But it stopped doing that in 2008 as part of the relief package for banks. Some additional um, relief was given to banks and bullion banks to stretch the laws out in new ways to create more paper contracts for gold and um, to keep the price of gold from reflecting the money printing. So for every trillion dollars in printed money they would do, the the banks would flood the um, gold market with naked short sales, as they're called. And this is not a theory. This is documented, been documented and proved. And so the price of gold to get it up tick, to get an uptick, it requires 10, 15, 20 times more buys than sells. And whenever the price of gold starts to inch up, then they increase that parameter to make it even more difficult. Whereas Bitcoin has no such problem. So Bitcoin reflects the money printing. And that's exactly the point Michael Saylor is making. He says that his balance sheet's falling apart at 20% a year, which reflects the money printing per year. And as he rightly points out, the inflation number that the government talks about is not has nothing to do with anything it's complete garbage and uh that's why bitcoin has been doing what it's been doing it it's not so much that bitcoin's going up it's that the purchasing power of the dollar is collapsing the u.s dollar is in a hyperinflationary collapse against bitcoin and that's going to continue in 2021 and it's already you see this in colombia i think it's parity with the satoshi and things like this going on i mean all over the world fiat money is collapsing and the this is what Michael Saylor did. He said, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to buy back my own stock with your printed money and be part of the game, be part of the club. I'm going to actually fight the Fed. I'm going to go to war with the Fed. And he's going to make a lot more money than those people who are just buying back their own stock, like the executives at Apple and other companies. 
Right. So, you know, again, looking at this, uh, the gold bug market versus uh, Bitcoiners and the the pessimism versus, versus optimism. I remember uh, Paul Tudor Jones, a uh, very well-known hedge fund manager who said he, he holds a lot of gold, but he holds a lot of Bitcoin now. And what he said is that Bitcoin is a bet on the future of humanity and human ingenuity, whereas gold, you're just counting on you know, the government not to squash you. And that's not a good way to be. You want to take human action, right? You want to be able to take action to protect yourself, to to have your sovereignty, to have all the things that Bitcoin allows for you to exit the system. With gold, you can't exit the system because they are the system. I'm not arguing against BTC, Luke Groman said. My position is that the preponderance is the evidence suggests the expansion of paper gold derivatives has prevented gold from doing what BTC, which doesn't have those paper derivatives, is now doing. So the thing is, like, we've known gold bugs for 20 years now, almost 20 years. And the whole time they've been complaining and complaining and complaining about the government and the central banks and conspiring against them. And it's like, well, you know, Bitcoin is an exit from that. Like why waste your time stressed out and worried about what the central banks are going to do to your wealth? Like they do want to steal your wealth. That's what they exist to do, right? Like Max always says that altcoins exist to steal your Bitcoin. That's what, that's what, uh, you know, they're reflecting the central banks that they aspire to be. Right. And they also complain about the price suppression and price manipulation. And the banks keep paying fines for manipulating precious metal prices and the gold bugs keep complaining about it. Instead of understanding that, wait a minute, they could just switch over to Bitcoin and actually participate in something that's moving along with that massive money printing that they're complaining about. They understand that there's a lie going on. Inflation is not one and a half percent. Inflation is a 20 percent. You have to go to the money supply figure to get the true inflation number. Uh, the, the cantillon effect is in effect so that 90% of the money print goes to a cadre of plutocrats and they are playing a very centralized uh, game of individual, you know, monopoly that, and then it, as we've explained many, many times before, but it's not one and a half percent. And when the central bank says we're fighting deflation, we need to print more money. That is incredibly libelous. That's slanderous. That's a blood libel. That's the most disgusting thing anyone has said in 50 years. And it makes people want to blood boil. And it should, because it's essentially robbing your future, your children's future, your grandchildren's future. Your, it's it's a, an, an enormously destructive phrase to say. It's a total outright lie. But Michael Saylor, you know, he's going to encourage other CEOs to jump in and say, wait a minute, the Fed's open to a speculative attack like the Bank of England was in 1992. And we broke the Bank of England. We made a lot of money. Now there's going to be a global parade of CEOs. They're going to break the global central bank cartel. And <laughs> you can get behind that and you can watch Bitcoin go up an enormous amount of percentage points. And, uh, you know, to hell with them. Right. And it's important. Like Michael Saylor is a billionaire and the billionaires are going to be fine. What is really important is you out there with a thousand dollars to your name or a hundred dollars to your name or fifty dollars to your name that you should protect yourself while you can, not only from inflation, <laughs> okay, that's one thing, but mentally, psychologically, don't be a loser. You can, you don't need to like cry at home all day about the Fed manipulating the price of your gold or silver coins or the government, you know, causing inflation with yet more stimulus package. You could just Every time they do that, you could either choose to cry and get stressed out and eat too much or drink too much or, or petition your government and send letters and, or nasty tweets at governors or senators or congresspeople, or you could just like, um, mm -hmm, okay, oh, they're continuing to be stupid. Okay, stack some sats. Go to swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy or forward slash Max. Stacy's not spelled with an E. If you do that one more time, I'm going to kick your ass. Just so you know, I'm going to kick your ass with the gold, with the orange sparkly shoe. So don't spell it with an E, but I should grab it too. But nevertheless, this episode is brought to you by swanbitcoin.com because we believe their product is amazing. We use it all the time. I've been smash buying like a mad woman. And because of that, we're going to have to go to this break. <laughs> no, I haven't gone bankrupt yet. Um, but I, I do want to throw to our guest, Nick Batia, because he wrote this book, which really 
lays out this transition and it really complements the um, our interview that we did with Safety and a Moose, who concentrated just on this fiat standard. But what is so revolutionary about Bitcoin, why I'm telling people with just a hundred dollars to name for like if you if you don't have a billion dollars to name, you still matter to Bitcoin. Look, you make a really good point there. The people who are constantly complaining about why the gold market's not working the way it should are doing so as a crutch to support their other bad habits. They might be alcoholics or drug addicts or overeaters. And in order for, to justify their bad behavior, they blame it on the bad gold market. Right. And this is the point I've made about a lot of gold bugs and high visibility gold mm -hmm. bugs. It's beyond that. They're just bad money managers at this point. They've got a psychological problem where they need to justify their bad habits by blaming the gold market and blaming Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. That there's nothing to do with money management. It's got nothing to do with the Fed, got, even though it sounds like it does, because they certainly use those buzzwords a lot. But it's actually a failure of character. People who have been stacking sats at a dollar a time, ten dollars a time for the last year, two years, three years, are like having the best year of their lives. They're escaped all of the self-pity and they're simply riding the vector to um, this fantastic, glorious, hard money future separating the state from money for the first time ever in human history. Think about it. You were born during a time when something unique is happening that never happened in the 200,000 years since man walked out of Africa. Right, for... As you'll see in this interview with Nick Batia, we've been on uh, the, the layer one of money, the foundation of our financial system, even today, the one that the Fed oversees was, is founded on gold. That's the one layer money that man has ever used globally, like, as we have uh, built a financial system upon. Yes, people have used beads and salt and bananas like in Mark Cubanville, but you know, never have we seen a, an entire financial system built upon a layer one money other than gold. So this is the revolutionary moment, is this moment whereby we have Bitcoin. And, it, you know, watch this interview, and I think you'll start to understand the gold, fiat, Bitcoin transition. Like, what, what is actually happening? What you are participating in? Why you are a winner and not a loser begging for the central bank to please stop manipulating the value of your gold or now, fiat holding? Now we want them to because it'll just make the Bitcoin go up that much faster. So play your silly games because we're going to, that's the fastest source in the race. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fed, for <laughs> all this free money. <laughs> right. Well, I am super excited for this interview with Nick Batia, the author of a new book, Layered Money. I've been reading it and it's been blowing my mind. So now I'm hoping we're going to blow the mind of the audience, Max. Yeah, it's an excellent book. You know, we've known Nick for a long time. He's always been super insightful into all things monetary. And uh, he was an early guy into Bitcoin. And now he's applied that that analytical mind to Bitcoin and give it an historical perspective that I think is missing. And now we've got it. Right. Welcome to Orange Pill, Nick Batia. Thank you. Good to see you guys, Max Stacy. Right. So I'm going to show everybody a little example. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, professor. I know you're also a professor as well. So let's say this solid gold ring here that I got at Monet.com and say this is a gold coin. This is like layer one money, as we've known for the past 5,000 years, essentially. This is layer one money. Layer two, paper money. So your book goes over the history of all of these. Everybody knows this one, but it goes over the entire range of the fin paper financial instruments that have been built essentially on gold. We'll get to Bitcoin by the end of this interview, whereby that's the first innovation, I think, in 5,000 years in layer one money. But um, let's uh, look at this book. So it's so it, it covers the entire history of gold and these layers as these layers build on top of it and how the once these layers are built, uh, you know, huge explosion and trade and commerce and innovation starts to happen. There are a whole bunch of periods in, covered in your book, but I want to focus kind of on um, a favorite of ours on the show because we talk about Renaissance 2.0, the Medici family. 
And then the Antwerp bourse. The U.S. dollar, as we all know, U.S. dollar goes brr, money printer go brr. And then, of course, Bitcoin. So let's go back to the days of Medici. What was unique about the Medici banking family? How did that end up starting like that? Like, what did they do to money that not only created their huge fortune, but also the freaking renaissance? Like, how did, how did that all happen? It really comes down to credit creation, right? And that's what, where the start of money as a credit system really took off was during the renaissance. And families like the Medici banking family, what they specialized in was lending and making money off of interest. And in order to lend money, they essentially had to create it. And how did they create it? They created it by issuing paper and promises to pay eventually gold and silver coin in the future. And so these promises really allowed a growth of money and a growth of credit and spurred a lot of economic activity. And um, this type of promise as money uh, really, it just, it changed money from metal, from an item to a system of promises. Right. So layered money. Uh, the first layer in this case would be gold. And then Medici was uh, very adept at lending out and collecting interest. And as you point out, it, it uh, people talk about the Renaissance in terms of the artistic expression and flourishing of arts at that time. But a lot of it was made possible by having the florin, which was a coin that was backed by the bank. And it gave a lot of people confidence. And with that confidence came the confidence to self-express. And this gave us huge works of art. Another kind of uh, big personality at the time, mathematician Luca Pacelli. Uh, I, I, I'm going to say that. You can correct my pronunciation. He taught math to Leonardo da Vinci, uh, one of the most famous for this quote, formalizing into scripture what had become the Venetian way of double entry accounting. So I didn't realize double entry accounting in Venetia in Venice was about the same time. It's really remarkable. So when the double entry accounting system, the secrets of how bankers could create money, not by minting a coin, but by their balance sheet, Nick. Absolutely. So this was uh, the, the art of double entry accounting uh, the origins perhaps come from the Middle East in a period uh, prior to the Renaissance. But Italian mathematicians, in including Fibonacci, uh, brought these ideas to Europe. And as they propagated and over a couple centuries, they finally formalized in what we know today as double entry accounting in this Venetian way. And this double entry accounting system the fact that it became standardized across Europe is what birthed this, this boom in money issuance and paper money issuance. It's because everybody started to agree on exactly how to account for everything, how to account for all these promises. And they had a standard. And this standard, uh, uh, along with the florin, as we talk about in the book, uh, the florin being an incredibly stable gold coin with a stable purity, and then a standardized accounting system for the continent together birthed this uh, layered money system that we have today. Yeah, essentially, when you make a loan, you, you put it on the book as a, an asset. That's correct. So, and, so um, and with those assets, and you can calculate those assets as such, you have the basis to make even more loans, right? So this is the beginning of a, kind of a derivative mindset where, you know, the loans are not actually liabilities, they're assets, they're assets of the bank, because uh, they, they're collecting interest on these assets. And so then now they're backed by gold. And uh, um, the, uh, of course, Bitcoin, I, I'm not, I don't want to jump ahead to Bitcoin, for, but it, it is referred to in a lot of ways as triple entry bookkeeping. And uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So um, I, I actually want to intervene right yeah. here because I want to uh, pick up on what you said about the Middle East, uh, you know, that Fibonacci and Pacioli had had found these ideas from the Middle East, because, of course, the Renaissance is coming out of the Dark Ages and it was a Dark Ages of Europe. It wasn't a Dark Ages of the Middle East, of India, of Mesopotamia or anything like that. They still had like, a, a, you know, an amazingly sophisticated financial system, you might call it. 
So let, uh, let's talk about the predecessors to w when the European Renaissance and the advances in finance happened, the, the second and third layers that started to develop on top of gold. Gold as money was considered money for 5,000 years, but that Lydia coin in the Persian Empire what, was the beginning of a huge advancement, just a, a, a shift in how you were able to measure, weigh and measure a standard unit of account. So when did that happen and why did it happen? And w what did it cause to basically create uh, the opposite of a dark ages in that, in that region of the world outside of Europe? Well, just think about the velocity of trade and how it can be hindered by if we don't have a money that we all agree on. So even if we agree across cultures that gold is good money, you have some bars that are random weights. I have some coins or jewelry. Uh, we don't know the purity of each other's gold. We don't know exactly how much they weigh in, unless we're performing all this calculation. <clears throat> and so what a, what a standardized coin did is it allowed for that velocity to pick up as people no longer needed to perform that calculation every time they were doing a trade. Um, this also brought about, you know, as coins developed, this brought about a whole, not, a whole separate issue of coin multiplicity in which your coins aren't the same as my coins and we need a money changer for every transaction. So that was the next level of uh, hindering the velocity and things that we had to get past. So you can see that, you know, coins helped, but then uh, it's, there were still problems with velocity and then uh, paper ended up helping that as well. Right. That, of course, we're going to get to this in a moment, but it, w there is a huge problem in the West, in this U.S. fiat dollar world of velocity of money. There's almost none of it, but that probably has all this uh, to do with what you're talking about. The second layers, third layers and above, like they require a lot of trust, right? The, the foundational, the layer one, gold, everybody knows is gold, right? You can weigh it. You, you know what it is. Um, and then we get to Bitcoin where you don't trust, you don't even need to trust, it's trustless, right? But before we, you know, as we then emerge out of soon after this Renaissance period, we had the Antwerp Bourse. Now, I think, you know, I, Max has to read the section because it's really his sort of specialty. He invented the virtual specialist technology, price discovery, all that kind of stuff is really, and he was an options trader. It all started in 1531. This this sort of, uh, you know, evolution of money and an innovation in money. So you say that the creation of the Antwerp Bourse in 1531 revolutionized money. It was the birthplace of the money market, the world's first exchange, the birth of price discovery, and the meaning of cash during this period was transformed from metal to paper. And cash, of course, comes in later in Bitcoin and the definition of cash. So elaborate for us, like, what is the significance of Antwerp in terms of the financial system today that we know? Yeah, it really comes down to this idea of discounting and the time value of money. Uh, so this is the idea today that we think that a piece of paper or any monetary instrument is worth a different amount today than it is tomorrow because money has time value. It has an interest rate. Now, we had these paper promises and accounting promises develop in the Renaissance, but those promises themselves were uh, of a defined maturity. They weren't cash. They didn't circulate out in the public. They were promises that were issued. And when the, when the expiry of the promise happened, that promise was done and, you know, another one would be issued. But the promises themselves weren't treated like we think of paper money today. And in Antwerp, that's what happened to these promises. These promises started to be traded with, the, traded with uh, brokers. And if you needed liquidity, which is turning something that doesn't have cash like properties into something that does have cash like properties, that happened in Antwerp for the first time when the, a market was made for this paper and discounting, which is, um, you know, I'll buy that paper off of you for a little bit less than it's worth on its face, gives it an interest rate just by 
just by math and by whatever the, the date on that piece of paper is. And this whole process really started in, in, in Antwerp and, and birthed what we think of as the money market, turning money from metal into this paper instrument world, which everything has an interest rate. Right. Also, uh, it's, it's the ability to broadcast prices, right? So before this happened, you had uh, people doing trades, you know, bilateral trades. They would go to the market, they do a trade, but somebody who was away from the market, 100 miles away, wouldn't really know what their, the price was. Uh, but with a quoted price and with a formal market and discounting going on, the 100 miles away, you could hear that, oh, you know what? The price of uh, my goods this year is around X, right? So then you have the ability to plan economically. You're saying, well, if the market 100 miles away is X, then my costs are going to be Y and my profits are going to be Z. So I'm going to maybe borrow some money and expand if that's what the market is because my costs are. So it's really the beginning of a, of a price discovery and, and, and a way to, uh, to, to create um, wide scale industry, if you, if you will, uh, aside from the way it was done before, which was more artisanal, where you know, you'd go to the souk and you'd say, I've got something to sell and you'd haggle for the price. And that price would not be known, actually. It'd be kind of kept to, close to the vest. People didn't really know what the prices were. But here you're saying you're broadcasting the price and then things migrate around those prices. <clears throat> so, and that's, that's another, I think, part of that revolution that's going on. And so the Antwerp story really gives the, the beginning of, of, a, of, of price signals. Not price signals, yeah, price signals. And the financial press, as you point out in the, in the book. So elaborate on that. Like, wh wh what did this price signal mechanism? What, like, we'd had thousands of years of human history. Things happened. Discoveries um, were made. Trade happened. Art was created. And yet, how did a pri price discovery and a price signal, like, how did this change the world? Like, what did we see happen? What I learned while doing the research is that where things are happening and the, and, the, and the idea of the international hub of commerce was so important throughout history where, and that's why I jumped from Antwerp to Amsterdam to London as we're going through time. It's because there was, one, there was always one city from Antwerp on that was the home of where the you know price discovery happens and in antwerp it was the price discovery place of price discovery for all the commodities of of europe and you know all this trade going on around the continent and middle east into asia these commodities found a price in antwerp and alongside the commodities was the price of money the price of bills of exchange and you know the price of paper for the first time published right alongside these commodity prices in, uh, you know, what we can call now, you know, the first form of the financial press. I thought that was really fascinating. Right. And I guess Antwerp still to this day is a center uh, for specifically diamonds. I think that diamond market, you still have a lot of the uh, mark, the price prices are kind of established in Antwerp in, in, in that business uh, pretty as, as a center, but I didn't, I didn't really know the Antwerp story so much as the Amsterdam story, which is kind of the next move. Came soon after that, right? Yeah. They, they kind of uh, squashed, ha, ha, what was the story? Cause they, they, they crushed uh, Antwerp and then within 75 years. Right. And then everybody knows about the exchange that was uh, created in Amsterdam. I guess it was like 1600. So uh, 1609 was when the bank of Amsterdam found, founded. And uh, that was in reaction to the Amsterdam Bourse, which was founded um, a few years before that. So, which was in response to the the, the Dutch East India Company's shares being issued. So, and that, but the the ship from Antwerp to Amsterdam real quickly happened because uh, during the Dutch Revolt, um, the the river that gave Antwerp access to the rest of um, the world was was blockaded and and essentially. Antwerp's run of being the international hub of commerce was ended overnight and uh, shifted to Amsterdam. Right. So uh, Amsterdam, as I recall from reading the history about it, it was uh, more of the introduction of a, um, a securities market, right, where you've got now people buying and selling 
these listed securities, or they're listing the securities and they're listing the paper on an exchange, right? So, uh, and this became a lot of volume. I guess it's kind of took the business away. Uh, interestingly enough, and again, serving from memory here, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it was about this time where we had the famous tulip bulb incident or historical time of the tulip bulb. Now, people don't understand that the tulip bulb phenomenon was driven in mostly because in Amsterdam, it became very easy to finance your tulip bulb purchase. It was a credit, uh, it was, it was a credit at a uh, bubble and credit essentially that drove this tulip bulb phenomenon. Uh, not that the bulb itself ha was considered to have like uh, unique properties like a fine work of art. It's that the credit was so easy that it drove a bubble. Is that correct? Yeah, so I think all financial bubbles throughout history exhibit the same characteristic in which, uh, you know, excessive credit is the last stage uh, where people are borrowing against anything that they can find as collateral. Um, and sometimes, you know, like we saw in the mortgage crisis in United States in 2007, no money down type of, uh, you know, uh, financial credit. So um, yes, uh, the story is kind of similar throughout throughout history. And in Amsterdam, the the money market itself responded to the securities market, like you were talking about. So securities, uh, the first joint stock company, the Dutch East Dutch East India Company, once their shares were issued and started to be traded, well, once you sold the share, what do you get on the other side of that trade? You need some form of cash, and that is itself what drove the next l level of innovation in the money market was the Bank of Amsterdam as a central entity issuing a deposit that everybody could use as cash on the other, specifically to be on the other side of the trade when you sell shares of the Dutch East India Company. So the Bank of Amsterdam was the first central bank? That's right. I mean, by our by our you know definition, you know, in the way that I describe it in the book, it's the first central bank because it was the first entity to issue a deposit centrally that ev and 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 ban the use of other forms of cash. Right. So, so it's a bit of an it's opposite a little bit because we know now the story is that money is loaned into existence. Uh, banks, uh, when a loan is taken out, they hit a button and they create on their balance sheet the item that they call cash. What you're saying is in, Am in, in Amsterdam, people would buy the stock first. And then when they went to cash it out, uh, in order to have something in the bank to reflect the proceeds, the bank created something called cash. <laughs> well, so it it's actually, it's kind of both so so let's go through it real quickly so the bank of amsterdam started by essentially um seizing the gold it was kind of you can kind of think of it like uh, executive order 6102 by fdr and 33 essentially seize the gold and issue a deposit it, it, and they 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 outlawed cashiers which were the the people that you know held gold and issued these cash slips that function as cash in amsterdam so they outlawed that activity and brought that in-house. So in the beginning, the Bank of Amsterdam was a fully reserved deposit. Like their deposit was backed by gold and silver coin from across the Netherlands. Um, then they also issued loans to none other than the Dutch East India Company, of course. And when they did that and issued loans to them, marked those loans as assets, as we discussed, and then issued deposits against it. So that's uh, the first example of a central bank having both, you know, metal, precious metal reserves, but also priv what I call privileged, privileged loans to, you know, at, in this point, it was the, the chartered, you know, uh, imperialist company and, um, and, and though, so gold and loans to the Dutch East India company were side by side on the asset side of the bank of Amsterdam's balance sheets and deposits were issued against that. So both things happened in Amsterdam. Right. Okay, so they confiscated the gold. They made, so, uh, but they, to get back to the theme of your book here, layered money, I'm assuming that they themselves were basing their end of the day accounting on a uh, storehouse of gold. 
Right. So they, you know, they had gold and silver coins on their asset side of their balance sheet and deposits of issued by the Bank of Amsterdam were the second layer of money. And that money, the second layer was essentially what was mandated that people use. And so this is the... Do we know how leverage they got at, at the height of this? Um, it what? So they actually weren't very leveraged. Um, you know, just from my research, uh, it was a mostly a reserved type of situation, um, f- which is far different than what ended up happening with the Bank of England. Next. So, but that was basically the the beginning of the centralization of monetary power. It happened at that time, but all this Absolutely. time, gold is at the top of that pyramid, you have all these images of pyramids of the, you know, various economies and monetary systems around the world for uh, thousands of years. So that was the beginning of the consolidation and uh, the end of decentralization, because it was the goldsmiths, really, who ran everything before, and they were all over the place, right? So there was something interesting you said in that whole chapter about Antwerp, and that you said that the, um, the evolution of money showed that it is human nature to keep tabs with each other. I did like essentially prefer credit to coin or heart, like metal or coins. And David Graeber proved something similar. I don't know if you've ever read his book, but 5,000 years of debt, where he said like, it's, it was always credit first. Like that you see that in, in Mesopotamia and that in, you know, the blank slate, the notion of the blank slate is that there was a slate that kept all your, the, the debts that you owed. So like, what does that tell you? What is that saying about, humans in general, money, their relationship to money and the situation we're in today, essentially. Yeah. And I think it goes back to this really, uh, you know, fundamental argument that people in Bitcoin have. And, you know, as we go into the future of money is store of value and medium of exchange. They are really different functions and credit and keeping tabs is how we function from a medium of, of exchange perspective in this world. Like we always have to just have credit and tabs so that we can do things a lot quicker because, you know, we can trust each other at a certain level to engage in economic activity. But when we're talking about storing multi-generational wealth, you can't do that with tablets of any sort or any credit instrument. That doesn't work. You need something that's physical like land, the way that that you know, uh, multi generational wealthy families have land and pass it down to their, uh, you know, to their families, and gold has served that function, uh, you know, throughout history, and Bitcoin is and will serve that function in the future, and so there are different uses for money. We can see that different layers of money solve different functions of more, you know, perform different functions of money. And and there's also something else that you point out is that, you know, as you say, it's store of value. Gold is, is you, you, there's a more element of trust in it. And then as soon as you put these second and third layers on, that's when trust you have to trust that it's all going to work and you're not right. going to be defrauded. Or the person's not going to go out of business. They're not going to lend more than they can deal with. And I, I suppose these are all these moments that you were talking about a, of economic crises are basically involved the trust issue. Like in 2008, no, none of the banks trusted each other. They all thought they had all bad debts on it. So let's move to the U S dollar because, you know, for, for hundreds of years, Europe ran on basically a, pretty close to a gold standard and you know it it made it went from amsterdam to london and power centers like that Uh, london also had tally sticks and other instruments but the u.s dollar especially since 1971 so i mean it's it's quite experimental quite revolutionary what's happened how it's it's tried to push itself as far away as possible from gold and pretend there's no link to it but what's what do you find is the most unique about the U.S. dollar system? I, I mean, and this is something that we've talked about before. the The fact that U.S. Treasuries, as a security, are the it, they're the only thing holding the dollar denomination together. Because without the U.S. Treasury security, there would be no form of dollar that is safe. It just it, there, because bank liabilities, which is which are most of the dollars out in the system, are so incredibly fleeting 
in their relation to par, you know, which means that, which basically means that at any time, uh, you know, the whole gamut of bank liabilities can lose value and can fall from a dollar to zero or, you know, even 95 cents, that is incredibly impairing to uh, the world. And so I just find it really interesting that, you know, treasuries are, you know, the most important asset in our current financial system. And it, and that is, uh, you know, part of the reason why interest rates are so low on US, U.S. Treasury debt is because the demand is so high because there's literally nothing else that you should be buying if you're looking for a safe way to store your dollars. What, what is the total supply of U.S. Treasuries at the so, moment? Yeah, it's about thirty trillion now. That's the number that we're tracking towards, uh, and it's and, and it's going up quickly. Uh, you know, it's going up really quickly during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I think it will be well north of thirty trillion uh, within the next couple of years. And, and how does that relate to M one, M two, M three? What are those numbers, and how does that relate to Treasury stock of Treasury? You know, so the Fed has even given up on trying to measure. Uh, monetary supply. I mean, the money supply uh, in in um, you know in terms of M three and and beyond. And when you look at M two, it just it's um, you know it's less because the Fed's balance sheet is now about eight trillion or somewhere around there. So you know, eight trillion is a lot smaller than thirty trillion, but it it just doesn't matter because the amount of money out there is it. it the amount of debt we know is about one quarter of a quadrillion. So that's, you know, north of 250 trillion in USD issued debt. And we all know that debt is money in our system. So that means that there is almost $300 trillion out there in some form or another, whether you want to call it M two or M3, or it doesn't, it just doesn't matter. There's just so much. And there's so little of treasuries actually relative to that other number. And so that's why we, we see when things go badly in the economy, basically 300 trillion worth of assets trying to squeeze into 30 trillion of treasuries. And let's just say, just like Bitcoin, where a lot of it is so tightly held, a lot of the treasuries are very tightly held as well. So the free floating supply is actually much less than that 30 trillion. Right. Now to get back to the, to the layers, um, this would be presumably backed by America's gold, of which they have 8,000 tons. Um, I know the total supply of gold around the world is something like 9 trillion. You're saying there's 30 trillion U.S. treasuries. I don't know, 8,000 tons would be obviously a lot less than the 9 trillion, probably less than 500 billion. So um, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but so 30 trillion in treasuries is backed by let's call it, you know, three to 500 billion in gold? Well, it, if you look, actually look at the hierarchy of the balance sheets, which is something that, you know, we do in the book, you see that the asset side of the Fed's balance sheet are U.S. treasuries. And U.S. treasuries are a debt instrument issued by the U.S. government. And so what is the asset of the U.S. government besides gold, the gold stock that you're talking about? It's basically the the idea that future tax revenue can come due to the United States government. So it's a combination of our tax money as Americans and um, the promise of that and the gold stock that they have. Right. So I need to explain to the audience, you were a former treasury uh, trader, right? You traded treasuries. So this is your understanding is quite deep of this. So what we're seeing right now in this year of pandemic that we've just gone through is that you know, people are starting to ask why they need to pay taxes anymore because there's so much magic money, ma- money is being printed. So when we say money printer go brr, like where is this money actually coming from? What do we need to look? Because there's, it's very confusing. It's no longer simple Medici d- days where there's just gold and the bills of exchange. Like it's like very complicated. What's the difference between uh, treasuries, T-bills, money, M1? Like when the Fed... When the Fed does QE, how is that different from when the government, you know, the Treasury is issuing it? Yeah, so it it comes down to what is the money that the Fed is issuing when they are printing money or they're doing QE? They are issuing 
second layer reserves, which are essentially the money that banks use as their asset. And so they're issuing money that banks use as their assets. That's it. That money doesn't necessarily trickle down to the third layer, which is deposit banking, which is the money that people use. And so when they print money, they're actually just printing assets for, they're printing reserves for banks. What banks choose to do with those reserves is really out of the Fed's hands. And that goes back to what you said about money velocity earlier. Money velocity is slow because that relationship between Fed creation of second layer money and bank creation of third layer money is broken. That relationship is broken. It's not working very fluidly. And so that, you know, that's what, hap that what, hap that's what happens with QE. And um, that's why QE doesn't really work to stimulate economic activity. It has the intended, uh, the wealth effect, uh, if you will. Right. So when the government sends everybody $600 in cash as part of a stimulus program, wouldn't it make more sense to give everybody a $50,000 line of credit at that half a point of interest? Yeah, uh, yes, of course it would. And, you know, the, the, it actually sets up really well for what, you know, the end of the book talks about, which is um, the fact that central bank digital currencies will be used as a way to give money to people that give second layer money to people in a way that they wouldn't have been able to do so in the past. You know, what we call helicopter money. Right. So, so. They, they, they are essentially compressing these layers because they realize the layers, it's not support. They can't support the layers anymore. It's too fragile. I mean, our friend, uh, we have a friend also in the banking business who's talked about this direct uh, QE for the people using a digital currency and in effect bypassing the banks. So are they going to throw the right. banks under the bus uh, and it, will that set up a bit of a contentiousness between these two groups? Yeah, and, and that is a huge that is a huge debate, Max, and something that's absolutely going to be at the center of all political discussions relating to central bank digital currencies over the next uh, few years. It will be this idea that, in, in a perfect way to say it, you're compressing the layers of money by getting. Uh, a second layer money into the hands of people really easily relative to what you uh, what the tools you previously had in your toolkit and that does change the role of private sector banks uh, fundamentally so and does it drive them out of business or does it drive them into different um, areas of you know financial intermediation um, I think it will drive them into different areas of financial intermediation. Yeah, talking I also about do, driving, they're going to become Uber drivers. <laughs> <laughs> they're also going to be issuing uh, their own their own tokens, their own stable coins with their with with um, you know the, it, their own benefits to them. So just as we you know have cash, PayPal, and a checking account to store our different various forms of cash, we'll have Bitcoin, Fed coin, and JP Morgan coin, and they'll all have different interest rates and different benefits to them. And, uh, you know, hopefully in the, you know, idyllic future, we'll all be, you know, able to s atomic swap between these uh, seamlessly uh, and, and, uh, and have final settlement in Bitcoin. Right. So Nick, the book is layered money. So as, as I'm talking to you here, um, it seems like one of the benefits of reading this book and having this book is that, and, you know, your approach is you're not trying to take a linear approach like this is the history and X, you know, we went down. It's more like this is a very complicated structure. And this book is like gives you a way to know what floor you are on in this structure. And then so it's omnidirectional. Like so throughout history, there's always these layers. And if you understand that, then no matter what country you are or what period you're in, you can kind of first assess what layer you're in, and then you can know what's above you and what's below you, and you can know how to navigate in, in that regard. Because uh, so so it's it, it's an interesting uh, topographical map, or you know, you're given a map of the financial world that is quite valuable, really, because it, it allows people to navigate this this crazy financial world 
uh, by just breaking it down up, up into layers, like just, just talking to you here, I'm able to apply some simple mathematics here and come up with some interesting conclusions based on the base layer and the financial layer and then see what happened in history. So um, on, that, on that score, it seems like a very valuable text. It is, it is. And the really thing that stands out to me is the constancy of human nature and human innovation and that struck me as something, you know, Paul Tudor Jones said about Bitcoin. As he said, it's a bet on the future of humanity and human ingenuity. And that's something that stands out of what we did with gold. We had gold and then we built all these things on it based on human um, nature, the human need to trade and credit and trust, but also like innovations like the discount rate or the um, reference rate and stuff like that. Like the, the things we invented are pretty awesome, but we now have a new innovation as you kind of alluded to with CBDCs, they emerge out of this uh, innovation, this invention of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the first innovation, am I right? In layer one in 5,000 years, right? Since we went from seashells to gold. Yes, and it only has happened, I guess, uh, because we look back now and see that it happened, right? It, it's, it didn't, Bitcoin wasn't the biggest invention of the last 5,000 years when Satoshi did it necessarily. Um, but now looking back on it, we can actually say, yes, in fact, that was because of the fact that Bitcoin has amassed all this market value and has a global user base, and most importantly, out of all, it is thought of as a global currency now by you know, tens of millions, if not over 100 million people around the world. So it is, it's already achieved money. And that is something that you know, we can say, in fact, it's the biggest, you know, monetary invention in, in several thousand years. Right now, you know, in the story here of your book, Layered Money, you have the Medici family in uh, Italy. You've got Antwerp, you've got Amsterdam, you've got the Bank of England in London. And you point out that these have become metropolitan centers and the centers attract interest and the market making is all done there. Here with Bitcoin, it's decentralized, right? There is no center and you've actually separated state from money. And, and, and this is, uh, can you just speak on that for a second? It seems like a re complete repudiation of the entire concept of a city. And does this both challenge central banks and the notion of having a city? Because we're in, in the COVID crisis, people are working at home and people are really questioning, why do I even need a city? And with my, if my money is not, if there's no Federal Reserve Bank, if there's no Bank of England and they're operating now decentralized and you've separated money from state, do we need cities anymore, Nick? Well, and that, you know, there's a, there's always been the argument, the FUD against Bitcoin, that the government is going to ban Bitcoin. Well, I don't, I clearly don't think that that is going to be a challenge um, for, especially for those of us in the United States and the West. Bitcoin is clearly not illegal by any means, uh, you know, at all. But the translation between Bitcoin and dollars and going between these two worlds, these two alien worlds to each other, because like you said, Bitcoin has nothing to do with the state or balance sheets at all. And there's no center of it at all. So there is a dichotomy there and governments will fight, uh, you know, to protect their own currency. Um, and, and they will put up barriers to, to translation between the two. Right. So I have a question to ask about this. I'm glad you pointed out that Bitcoin, nobody knew we were around in 2011 I know in 2009, 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013, nobody understood what we had invented, what we had in our hands. I likened it to, you know, there was a, um, a Chimabue a masterpiece found in this woman's house in France just recently, about a year or two ago, and she was something in her mid-90s, and she had had this um, masterpiece above her kitchen um, you know, the stove for years, for decades. She didn't know it was a masterpiece and it had soot and all sorts of stuff on it because she didn't know it was a masterpiece. We didn't know we had invented something that was so, that was an greatest invention in thousands of years at that time. And that's why it, looking back on it, it seems like we were reckless, like we were uh, trading our seashells, you know, 
it, it, we were trading our gold for seashells. Like we were still willing to take that trade. It seems like crazy that the, this, how little we were t- accepting for our Bitcoin or just giving it away. Yeah. And people, uh, you know, I came into Bitcoin in 2016. So, you know, relatively late, so to speak. Uh, um, but, you know, Hal Finney knew it at the beginning. So it wasn't that nobody knew. It's just that very few people knew. And now we're in 2020 going into 2021. And, you know, there are, you know, many millions of people that know. And, uh, you know, one day maybe billions. Yeah, right. Hal Finney did know, but I do want to say that and, yeah. he kind of saw it like being one, he saw it competing in the Forex market, which seems quite small even now, like compared to what actually Bitcoin is. But I want to- uh, Well, it's, yeah, it's a $5 trillion a day. But the, the nodes of Bitcoin um, really, in retrospect, uh, also in context of what we're saying about price discovery and broadcasting. So every 10 minutes, all the nodes are, are in sync. So that 10, the cycle where it used to take for price discovery, when I was working on Wall Street, you know, you wouldn't know what the price of your stock was until the afternoon edition of the daily newspaper. There was no financial media whatsoever. Then uh, we had the beginning of the financial news network, which became a CNBC, and people then started to track these things in real time. But you still had a lag time. You're still 15 minute delay. You still have uh, you don't. But with Bitcoin, the network is the broadcast are simultaneous and continuous every 10 minutes. You know, for and everything is completely in sync and audited every 10 minutes. So that that I, again, that idea of space and time and the needing to communicate the price signal. Is, is overridden really by the protocol that maintains, first of all, this monetary policy that's uncorruptible of issuing X number of coins every 10 minutes. So nothing can stop it. Nothing gets in its way. And it does send a broadcast to the network globally every 10 minutes and even over satellites. So, I mean, think about the quantum leap in both price signaling, communication, market making, and planning. Again, if you know what the price is going to be, if you know a block's coming in another five minutes and you know a lot of that information, you can start like Michael Saylor at MicroStrategy said, <laughs> I'm, going to buy, I'm going to put a $1.2 billion into this because I know that five years from now, 90% of the financial infrastructure will become obsolete. Yeah. And this idea of quarterly static balance sheets I discuss in the book, uh, they're going to go by the wayside in favor of dynamic, live, auditable balance sheets. Um, And that is the way of the future for sure. Right. That audible thing, of course, is, you know, it really stands out in your book of the, the, the nature of trust, that there's so much trust and that it can evaporate overnight is a problem in the second and third layers of, of money. Um, Bitcoin has less of a problem with that because of the audible nature of it. But let us know your thoughts on lightning and how lightning, what it adds to Bitcoin and how uh, I've seen you say like that it's, it basically turns it now into the U S treasury market sort of situation. Like it's that powerful. It's, it's added so much power to Bitcoin as money. So my first thesis about Lightning Network was that it was incredibly powerful because it gave Bitcoin a counterparty free time value in which you can stake your Bitcoin to a liquidity pool and earn interest off of that in a, in, and never having to give up that Bitcoin. Um, and that it was unique in all of monetary history. Uh, now, I also understand something additionally about lightning that you know is coming together in this book which is that lightning enables bitcoin to be used in hash time lock contracts and these hdlcs these contracts these are the most powerful financial contract that is that are attached to um a first layer money that has ever existed and so think of Think of gold um, with, (laughs) think of every gold coin with an entire computer on top of it in which you you have a standardized suite of financial contracts that you can use with this this base money. And that uh, HTLC capability of Bitcoin with the Lightning Network now basically enables Bitcoin to become the center of the entire digital asset world by driving future digital assets into some sort of 
compatibility with the Lightning Network uh, HTLCs. All right, Meaning all right, that, hold on, hold on a second. Yeah, okay, so let's okay. say <laughs> I'm a guy with a billion dollars in Bitcoin versus a guy with $10,000 in Bitcoin. And on top of each Bitcoin stack are the HTLC suite of services. And we're entering a period of deflation where price differentials between everything approaches zero. And I am using my imagination to create a virtual reality of a yacht in the middle of the Caribbean Ocean on top of my $10,000 Bitcoin stack that is no different than the guy with $10 billion who has the actual yacht in the Caribbean, right? My point being that are we getting to the point where this idea of money changes dramatically and it's just based on the imagination you are like uh, somebody says you know owning knowing is owning like if you can ma if your imagination can take you there so can bitcoin so why even bother getting a 10 billion dollar war chest as long as that html stack on top of your bitcoin gives you the uh, frictionless uh, ability to propel yourself purely by your imagination the imagination is free to travel without any friction. Is that anywhere in the zip code of what you're thinking about? Well, I can say it like this. The Bitcoin that you have as collateral will be able to, uh, will be able to give you other layers of money or lower layers of money or more inferior types of money if you so choose to do so. So, uh, because you can prove that you have it, you have, and that has nothing to do with HTLCs. That's just the fact that you can prove ownership of your Bitcoin um, to anybody. And so as long as you can do that, uh, you can use it as right. So you can prove anything. you own the Bitcoin and you can prove it to yourself because it's verifiable to your mind, to yourself. And therefore your imagination is free to proceed without doubt, without fear. If we remove That's fear from our consciousness, then we're totally free. And it doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you have underlying that, that, that transmutation. But anyway, I digress. Uh, Stacy, I, I do want to say, though, but basically what you're saying is, is that lightning enables us all to be Medici. It does, actually. Lightning enables anybody to use their Bitcoin productively in a counterparty free environment, which is incredibly unique. And it also enables, uh, you know, atomic swaps, which are basically trades to other digital assets without having to use an exchange. And so, uh, you know, that's not something that, you know, I'm talking about use your Bitcoin to swap it into other assets. I'm talking about a world in which central banks and banks create digital tokens just to make sure that people can swap them into Bitcoin. And that's how that they will attract value and demand just because they are some bridge or a gateway to Bitcoin or they fall within the Bitcoin layered money system. So in our final moments here, do you agree with Paul Tudor Jones that Bitcoin is a bet on humanity versus he said he owns a lot of gold, but that gold is a bet against it. That, you know, where, you know, betting on gold is betting on each of us sitting at home hiding with our guns and our gold versus uh, building on a future, building a better future with Bitcoin. The limits of gold are are known and they are um, they're black and white and they have thousands of years of proving them to us. The future of Bitcoin is unknown and unlimited. So I would completely agree with him from that perspective that a bet on Bitcoin is a bet on all this ingenuity that we can do things and we can trust the Bitcoin code algorithm and its history and its security from its mining network to give us a base for uh, economic activity in the future. Um, gold is, is, is limited in that it does have that fear component. It is, it is pure money and it will give you uh, an escape from a counterparty, uh, a reliance on counterparties, but it's limited in what it can help create in the future. It's, it, it will sit there. 
So that's interesting. So we have the first new base money since gold from thousands of years ago. So imagine all that humans did in those 5,000 years, the horrible stuff, but also the, the amazing stuff, the stuff we've built. So if we're going to get through these next 5,000 years, maybe we need a more perfect money. Maybe it was Bitcoin came at the right time. And that who knows, maybe we will get to Mars. Maybe we will get to other galaxies. You know, anything's possible. Yeah, and that that is the hope. I think that's the what we find uh, as um, a lot of optimists in Bitcoin, people that think that the human race can do anything and that Bitcoin will help empower that. And uh, yeah, I would agree with that. I would say I'm one of those optimists that hopes that Bitcoin can create uh, a brighter humanity. That sounds good. All right. So Layered Money is the title of the book by Nick Batia. So where can people get this book? So the book is available on Amazon for pre-order for the Kindle version uh, right now. So you can go to Amazon and find it there. Um, that book will be published on January 26th. So if you pre-order the Kindle uh, version today, it'll be delivered to your device on the 26th of Jan. Um, and then the, the print version uh, will also be available at that point. There is no pre-order for the print version at the moment. And what um, is so, your uh, Twitter handle? So you can find me on Twitter at time value of BTC. Uh, you can find um, me at layeredmoney.com where there's more information about my book. I love that you are so into time value. That's your thing. <laughs> well, you know, the time value of Bitcoin was my first uh, research article that I wrote um, for the public. And uh, and I just decided to uh, to latch onto it. Right. Well, I, I, I encourage everybody to read the book. I mean, it really had for me and I have a load of Bitcoin books. It's my favorite so far. And I. I just love learning all those things about these great mathematicians and and how uh, something that seems so obvious now, just like, you know, so many people who enter Bitcoin, they come in like acting like OGs, like, uh, you know, a, as if all that knowledge, like, why didn't you have that knowledge back then? Like, because it seems so obvious now, but the same through several moments that you really highlight throughout the book of history of like, wow, we lived for thousands of years without that discount rate, like w everything changed then or without a second layer. Like, it, it's just amazing that everything seems so obvious. And, it, you know, the 2020 hindsight, I guess it's called. Yeah. And well, that's I'm why really, people, I'm, yeah, go ahead. I'm really glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> what were you going to say, Max? <laughs> well, I mean, but even for people, but, but it's a lonely pursuit to be ahead of the game. If, if you're, if you have the understanding before everybody else, it doesn't make you popular. Yeah, uh, it, it's been a it's been an interesting journey, and uh, I I hope that um, layered money becomes a, a more common terminology in the future as a result of this book. Yeah, just like Black Swan or something, you know. He can, and I seem to love can't have all the memes. Nick Batia's right. got to have a few memes too, you know. He can't monopolize all the memes. Layered money, it's right up there with the um, Black Swan. I'm Our excited for the first layered money memes. Well, our group of Orange Pill Podcast Telegram group, they're really good at the memes. Yes, so. come into the Telegram group and uh, that, that'll be your first 1,000 sales right there. <laughs> Love it. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Yeah, fast, fantastic interview. Nick Batia, Layered Money. It's a great book. It's a companion piece. He's right up there with the, the deep thinkers on money, along with Safe Dina Moose and others. You know, he's really got it. Now, this has been brought to you by swanbitcoin.com forward slash max <laughs> and uh, forward slash Stacy, if you would, would prefer. There's no E. And, um, you know, Swan Bitcoin is the easiest on ramp there is. People say every day, how do I buy some Bitcoin? The answer is if you're in the United States, it's always the same answer. Swanbitcoin.com. The fees are the cheapest, it's the easiest. They got smash buys up $600 a day, I think. $600 a smash buy. Yeah, they increased it to $600, partly because of the maniacs in the Orange Pill Podcast Telegram group yeah. couldn't get enough. Right, and they're having, it's a great company, great great team over there. Follow them on Twitter. Follow their YouTube channel. Follow Bitcoin TV on YouTube. You know, they got a whole swan Bitcoin uh, phenomenon going on. They sponsored this show, and, um, you know, they, they're, they're, hello?
Uh, I think uh, I think everybody knows swanbitcoin.com forward slash Stacy sponsors the show. So I want to um, ask about this Nick Batia interview. We can never repeat enough. You can never you know, have too many. That's what uh, Billy Mays, I think, has proven to the world. Uh, the uh, master behind the greatest telemarketing sales pitches in the world mm. that you can never say the brand name often enough. I think that's that's a key element in, in marketing and advertising is that the, to say Swan Bitcoin uh, over and over again for 35 minutes is not, you're not violating any marketing rules by that. That does, that's not. Well, wrong tell the that. audience who Billy Mays is because maybe they don't know who Billy Mays is. And then we'll get into the, our interview with Nick Batia well, about B- what B- our Billy thoughts Mays were. along with Vince are, you know, Vince with the, who came up with the classic line, you're going to love my nuts. Uh, he was great pushing the nut chopper and veg chopper. Uh, Billy Mays, of course, with OxyClean is one of the greatest uh, telemarketing pitchers in history. He died recently, um, it, it, prematurely, at a, a young age, sadly, because the world is, uh, we miss Billy Mays so much. And But I think Vince is still around and he's still telling people that uh, they're going to love his nuts. And if you go to YouTube, there's some great mashups of Billy Mays and Vince doing their classic uh, pitches uh, together. And it's fantastic. I, I can't recommend that enough. But the point being that Swan Bitcoin repeated over and over and over again is is, is not really going to stop somebody from clicking on SwanBitcoin.com forward slash Max or forward slash Stacy with no E because it's key. It's key. It's a key moment in life. Right. And so I want to uh, point out with the Nick Batia interview, it's, uh, his book is coming out soon on Amazon. Uh, you can sign up for it. I think the download is, is available this week. But the thing is, it's, it's a really amazing chronicle of history of, of moving from just having that layer one money of, of gold to moving to layer two and three and four and all these like derivatives and financial system upon it and debt systems upon it. But it's, it, it lays out, you know, how we got to this point. So it's really important, I think, to understand how we got to this point. Because when we were talking in the first half about all these people holding gold because gold holds its value and they see that the governments and the treasuries and the central banks are, are devaluing their money. But as he lays out and chronicles how it happened that the central banks own all the gold, like all a lot of the amazing periods in history, like the Renaissance, all happened when the central banks did not own the gold. It was the likes of Medici, but Medici was one of many bankers. Like it was a very decentralized system where goldsmiths, you know, ran the the layer one financial system upon you know they they created the layer two they mm. lend lend out against it but it was pretty much one for one like they, because they were ruined if if the thing fell apart right um so it's just a, it's a fascinating book to see how we are where we got to today because if this system is falling apart it's good to know like what exactly went wrong and how you got there I couldn't have said it better myself, and uh, therefore I won't even attempt. It's so eloquent, so precise, so beautiful, so lovely. And, you know, one thing that the gold bugs always said to us, and, uh, you know, when we interviewed them on Kaiser Report and stuff like that, is when they're complaining about the central banks manipulating gold prices and Jamie Dimon, uh, J.P. Morgan manipulating gold prices, and they paid the billion-dollar fine this year and then proceeded to manipulate gold markets again for a billion dollars worth in order to pay the fine, is... um, you know, they're, so they're always complaining about uh, the the manipulation, but they said like one day it'll break, right? Because there's only so you can only do this for so long. They've been doing it for 50 years now that we're in 2021. It's the 50 year anniversary of an all U.S. dollar fiat standard, and so you know that one day this this whole thing will fall apart, and and then finally we'll achieve the yeah, value. Remember of that our rumor gold. was that oh someone's gonna make a raid on the Comex and demand mm-hmm. physical delivery. Yeah. Right. So they're talking about this game theory that was supposed to kick in at some point that you can't keep printing all this money and doing all these naked short sales and violating all these rules and regs until somebody stands up and they demand delivery of physical and they're gonna break the back of the cartel. 
And it never happens because there's no limit to how much of this fake money and fake naked short selling that they can do. So nobody is going to stand up and shovel sand against the tide because that's what you're doing when you're fighting the fiat money cartel until Michael Saylor. You know, I don't want to you know keep beating the Michael Saylor drum, but this guy is like Gladiator from the film Gladiator. You know, he stood up and he is taking on the empire. And he's attacking the central bank. I mean, they can't emphasize this point enough. I don't see the media. I don't see mainstream media pointing out the fact that Michael Saylor's launched a one-man war against the central banks of the world, it, it, even though it's exactly what's happening. The more Bitcoin goes up, the greater the certainty of the U.S. dollar collapse. I mean, there are a lot of people with vested interest in the U.S. dollar. And as the U.S. dollar collapses, it's going to cause incredible political, economic, and social dislocation. Does anybody want to focus on that? No, which is fine, because number go up, 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 well, up. That, well, what I was going to say is that I also, really? I think that the system was always, it was destined to die. The U.S. dollar is always was going to die. It will die. It's, it's destiny, just like that artwork we saw in Mexico City of a little baby. Welcome to the world, little baby. You'll soon be dead. That was uh, 1971, August 1971, the same thing for the U.S. dollar. It was destined to die like all other fiat currencies before it. But the thing is, like, what, what, if before Bitcoin, what was going to happen? Like, okay, if we didn't have Bitcoin and it, the dollar was going to die, well, then it would be a gold-based system that at least temporarily replaced it. But the U.S. government owns a huge stash. Like it, it, the, the, the central banks and the governments, the same people who created this disaster, they're the ones had it. So like it brings me back to our discussion that we had with Alex Gladstein of the Human Rights Foundation. And what he said about what we, our conversation talked about these nations like Iraq or Syria or Libya or Egypt. And when um, the, the, when the, their their governments are toppled, but there are no institutions there to mm. fill in the vacuum, right? Well, the same thing would have happened with uh, the collapse of the dollar. But now there's an entire system, a robust Bitcoin network to replace when this dollar collapses. And I, I don't think it's going to survive 2021. In fact, that's my prediction for the opening of this year. I don't think the dollar will survive as we know it 2021. Right. That's why you can come up with the price prediction for Bitcoin that is, you know, really high because the dollar, it, it, you know, the dollar could be entering a death spiral. And, and mm. you know, that means that. <laughs> you know. I mean, that's that, that is actually what what they're saying. All these bankers like Bank of America, Citibank, JP Morgan saying that uh, Bitcoin is going to go to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Well, what they're saying is the dollar is going to die. Yeah. Like that's like remarkable coming from <laughs> banks that live at the luxury. You know, they're cantillionaires because of the Fed and and the dollar system. Right. For Bitcoin to be at six hundred fifty thousand dollars a coin, the dollar would drop sixty seventy percent. The D the the DXY index, which is uh, currently at around uh, eighty five between eighty five and ninety, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, the lowest it's been historically has been in this mid mid 70s to 80 or so mm -hmm. so we're talking about that trading down to 2025 <laughs> and um that means that your purchasing power is going to drop by 60 70 percent so your wages aren't going higher by 60 or 70 percent and um that's and we already have social unrest i mean i see these videos of people you know rioting everywhere that that's that's courtesy of the Federal Reserve Bank by destroying purchasing power because fiat money promotes war and violence. Bitcoin and sound money promote peace. So um, those trends are going to like hit that hockey stick moment. Hmm. It was as Bitcoin is hitting that hockey stick moment in 2020. And then in 2021, it'll, it'll be ubiquitous. So like the internet was rattling along in the 90s and then in 1998 or so it hit that ubiquity moment where it suddenly became like oh everyone just accepted it and you can't imagine life without the internet anymore even though in 1995 when i was doing the internet in los angeles 
1995, 1996, even 1997, there was still a large number of people in Hollywood and in the business community who were questioning whether or not the internet was a fad that was going to go away like hula hoops, yeah. or it was actually significant in some way. And that's been the story with Bitcoin up until 2020, when now you've got now suddenly the big battleships of industry and business and money managers are moving into Bitcoin. Uh, and then 2021, you hit ubiquity, where suddenly, okay, 3 billion people are now in some way involved with Bitcoin. And, uh, and the price obviously is going to reflect that. Imagine buying, you could own a piece of the internet in 1995, 1994, 1995, you could actually own the protocol that is the internet and you could own a piece of it before it became worth, you know, what is the internet worth today? It's probably worth a quadrillion or more, but you could have bought it when it was still worth almost nothing. Same thing with Bitcoin. It was worth a penny. Now it's worth 28,000. And it'll be worth oodles and oodles more because it is, it's redefining time and space in terms of our understanding of time and space uh, going into 2021. And it's, it's even more than, okay, like I was following a thread who this a person who worked at McDonald's spent, uh, a, you know, a smash buy, bought some Bitcoin $100 every week for the last two years. They now have about $168,000. Okay, that's great. Cash, value, money, price, number go up. The other thing that's important is like when these institutions fail, look across America right now. Okay, the institutions are nowhere. They're, the economy shut down. Like <laughs> what's the plan? There is no plan. Nobody knows what the plan is. We see thousands of people waiting in line at a food bank. You know, right. th this is the equivalent of what's going to happen when the, the, the fiat system collapses is, are you going to stand in line for some new, you know, for the new coupons are going to issue in order to get something like to save yourself? Or can you save yourself now? Like put on the life vest, get in the lifeboat now. You know, Bitcoin is that exit plan that you could do now. You don't have to be like terrified and stampedes and scared and, and wondering how you're going to feed your family or take care of your, you know, yourself, earn a living or, or buy products or, you know, anything like that. So you, it's right now there's the calm, the calm before the storm. There are so many people in America, in the American government, in the American military, in the American police departments and globally that have unconfiscatable non-sovereign wealth in the form of Bitcoin. And we're just watching this unfold. I mean, it never in history have, has this happened. You know, usually mm. your isolated tribe in the middle of nowhere, or you're engaged in the social contract, part of a city or nation state, right? And there's very little in between. You can be either welded into governance that's centralized or you're out in an isolated tribe nowhere and you have your own economy as it were never in the history has it been able to, for an isolated tribe living in the metropolis to take all their wealth and walk away and you can't do anything about it you can't take it you can't, you can't inflate it away. You can't do anything. Think about that. You can just walk away. That's the first time ever in history you can walk away. I mean, the problem with being an isolated tribe on the edge of the metropolis is that you, by definition, you're not going to benefit from the, the economies of scale that come from a city or a nation state. Part of those trade-offs you make with the social contract. But here, you're a sovereign. You can walk away. You, you are your own country. And it's just a unique time in history. It's completely unique. And, you know, I just don't see, I don't see many people going down with the ship. I just think, you know, unless you're Nancy Pelosi or somebody who's like just such a, you know, sleaze bag, uh, corrupt person. Just if you're just in like just a hundred percent made out of corrupt corruption, unless you're a hundred percent corrupt, you would never do, you would never want to do that. So even if you're like have 98% corrupt and have 2% uh, 
not corrupt, you would still walk away from that situation because that 2% of Bitcoin is going to be worth more than you could make being 98% corrupt or 99.9% corruption is not going to outperform a 10th of 1% of Bitcoin. Like those people who are in the fund industry who put 1% of their assets into Bitcoin are outperforming all the rest of the fund industry. And they didn't even put more than 1% of their assets into Bitcoin. If you, this guy at McDonald's put $100 a week into Bitcoin, now he's got a 120 something thousand dollars, which is more than he's going to make at McDonald's in what, 10, 15 years after tax to the ability to save it after tax and everything else that comes and uh, property tax, sales tax, all that nonsense that the, uh, the centralized kleptocrats take, right? So imagine that. I mean, and that's just, it's unbelievable to me that, we're actually born in a time where we're going to see the nation state as a concept collapse after, you know, 2000 years of since it was invented in Greece, we're going to actually see this thing collapse. So the first, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Yeah. And again, I know collapse sounds like a bad word and they are, um, the, the elite know this, the elite are aware of it. And that's why they're talking about things like a new Bretton Woods. They're talking about, um, the great reset and that's what Renaissance is, is a reset, okay? It's a rebirth. It's starting from fresh, from a blank slate. And that's what happened with the collapse of the Catholic Church, the power of the Vatican uh, post-Black Plague, the bubonic plague that wiped out Europe. Th that institution collapsed and the, the Dark Ages ended. And I think what you're going to see is that, it, especially in hindsight, you'll be able to see that this was the dark ages. These past few decades are the dark ages that we all got through. And I think, you know, I, I, again, like, I, I think you just have to be prepared that th for good times, like things are going to get just better. Get like, prepared for good times. Yeah. Most people, I mean, I, prepare I, for good times, <laughs> prepare for good times. A lot of people aren't prepared for things to go well. Like, I mean, even I have been like that. Like, I'm just, you're just used to like the government smashing and grabbing whatever it wants, harming people, bombing whoever, like, you know, like remember those protests before their invasion of Iraq, the, the hugest protests in British history. We were in the UK then. It didn't matter. Nothing happened. The, their government could just do what it Stacey was. Stacey says prepare for good times. Yeah. Prepare for good times. Get ready. But, you know, it's interesting. So they're going to do the Great Reset. They're going to do the Brenton Woods. Yeah. And they're going to do central bank digital currencies. Like, you can tell they're desperate. They're just throwing any shit against the wall to see what <laughs> sticks. They don't have any idea what to do. They're going to try every playbook from every decade going back 100 years, 200 years. Yeah. They're just grasping at straws like, should we do a new Brenton Woods? Should we do a reset? Should we create a central bank digital currency? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Christy Lagarde, what do you think? Man, I am Christy Lagarde. I'm oh my French, God. Oh my God. and I run a big bank. <laughs> and I'm, oui, je suis intelligent, mais je suis parlé, mais bon, on pense que... Um, right? No, that's not going to work. No. And you've They're got, scared. They remember are Remember Dominic Strauss-Kahn? He was like, you know, <laughs> what did he end up in some gutter somewhere, you know, in a with swingers a club, croissant but... <laughs> stuffed up his sphinx sphinx. What does this guy know? <laughs> Nothing. Christy Lagarde sent cut from the same corrupt cheesecloth. They're not going to do anything. They, they are so scared. And you're going to have more and more of that sort of Soma thing. Like, don't worry. Don't be alarmed, people. We have a new coupon for you. <laughs> a it's new the, coupon. Yeah, it's a, it's a token packed with a coupon. And it's going to be okay. It's a new coupon. <laughs> Remember, when I was a kid, we had the s and green stamps. Yeah, so did we. You know, and, and you come back from the grocery store, and in the bag were these Green stamps, you know, and then you get the books and you put the green stamps in the books. Oh, that was my job, man. I loved it to put the green stamps in the book. And you get to fill up enough books, you go back to the grocery store and you get a can of tuna fish. That's right. You get a can of tuna fish for your S and H green stamps. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, and that's 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 what we're gonna come back with. It's gonna be like, hey people, you're we're sending you some more of these green bucks, you know, <laughs> in your bank account. Uh, so you can afford a protein pill and click on some more ads at Facebook. 
Uh, right. And it's going to be uh, the addition of what they've learned in China. So there's going to be a social credit score tied to it. And if you snitch on your neighbor, mm. like if if your neighbor forgets to recycle or your neighbor That's right. didn't wear a mask when they walked to the, the you know, the My neighbor the not wearing a mask. Yeah, then Do I get another you, coupon? Yes. It's, that's that's the sort of system that they're going to encourage. And because because it's with their fiat system, of course, it's they have to enforce that because there is no God. There is no um, elementary nature to, say, the gold or to Bitcoin. Like there's an absolute scarcity. There is no absolute quality to it other than fear. That's all they have to like. That's sell. it. They're more, they have fear. to impose more fear, especially once this grid collapses mm, the next mm, grid will have mm. to have more violence because they know that you're like there will be doubters out there so they're gonna have to uh, inflict more violence everything gonna be violent you know it's like mouse traps in the cereal boxes you go to the grocery store to pick up some quick or some wheaties and you put your hand up there ah mouse trap i need a coupon u.s government <laughs> you know it's just gonna be like joy buzzers they're gonna everyone's gonna have one of them joy buzzers you know hey how you doing joe ah it's going to be up, but they're going to put like 50,000 watts in there. It's going to kill people. They're just going to like, I killed my neighbor who was snitching. Do I get another coupon? And they know you killed him because the Joey buzzers is electronically connected to the crime net and the torture <laughs> net put out by the U.S. government. As more people you zap with the Joy buzzer, the more coupons you get delivered to your American government crypto wallet. Then we got a lot of them down here at the Federal Reserve Bank. We got five. Hi, I'm Billy Mays. I run the American Central Bank. We got 57 quadrillion coupons to send you right now. We're going to send you a coupon right now. Just send it. Call right. And there's more. There's more coupons where they came from. We're never going to run out of coupons. Just send us a call. 1-800. I'm fucking broke. We're going to send you more coupons. Hi, I'm Billy Mays, United States government. I'm now the president of the United States. We're going to send you OxyClean plus more coupons. Isn't that right, Vince? That's right, Billy. You're going to love my nuts. The more you love my nuts, the more coupons I send you. I'm I'm Vince, and I sell nut choppers right here on QVCT. Love it. Oh, it's never going to stop. I love it. More. And that's the way it's going to be. People plugged in. They're going to take the TV, the coaxial cable, and stick it into the left ventricle of their heart. And they're going to put their toe into the electric socket and say, give me more coupons, Billy. Ah, ah, ah. The government's gonna be money go burr, money go burr, money go burr, money go burr, burr is pump it up. Oh. Jesus. And the people with the Bitcoin Whoa. be like, whatever. Whoa. Max is like whatever. pumped up. Right. You know what? This is a good time to <laughs> exit this episode. I'm wearing I'm wearing magenta underwear. I he actually probably is, but the thing is, I want, I want to say is that while you're fired up like this, why not do what? a spontaneous ad for SwanBitcoin.com as oh, we yeah. exit? Okay, Swan Bitcoin for those days when you want to smash by at Swan it Swan isn't Bitcoin. Red. It isn't blue. I'm helping you. Do it. The orange pill is here for you, here for you, here for you. Wow, that was beautiful. I thought you were going to be screaming like Billy Mays. I'm just like taking in the beauty of your voice and your overall <laughs> beauty, your beautiful quality. <laughs> I think Sean Lennon might sue me for uh, singing that badly, so badly, his song. Like he might be like. That woman has ruined my song, and uh, she owes me some sats for that. Right. So, hasta luego, amigos. Have you learned any more Oh, Spanish? are you like Hilaria Baldwin? You speak Spanish now? <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie daisy. Oops, I'm a better actress than Alec is. I fooled him to think I'm Spanish. <laughs> he buy, he marries an exotic European woman. How, Not how, from how do, uh, a uh, yuppie from uh, uh, Massachusetts. How, how do you say in English? Uh, good, Cucumber. Uh, hasta luego. C cucumber. No. <laughs> Bye. Bye now. Peace. Peace and love.